And welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today for uh, the May edition of Learn with Google. Uh, I'm joined with my colleague uh, Steve and Darren, um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through some cool stuff and have some special guests for you today as well, which is awesome. Um, the the topic today we're talking about is called the device makes the difference. Uh, why Chromebooks make sense for students and teachers, and I've had two schools volunteer to uh, share some of the great stories that are happening in their schools with Chromebooks, which is um, pretty exciting. Uh, before we get started on that, uh, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which uh, we meet today, or who you are meeting. I'm actually in Manila, Philippines at the moment, so this is not my lands right now, but uh, wherever it is for you back in Australia, um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture the land and honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the, in the imagination of that continent, Australia. And to Steve. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, Tihe Modiora, um, in the Mauna Whakahi, in a Waituku Kiri, uh, ki te tūpuna tenākoe, tenākoto katoa. So welcome in to you. Um, greetings across the waters that we meet on and paying respects to the elders that came before you. So welcome in and, and thanks, Chris, for joining us internationally. So a, a couple of three different countries in this call today. I know, right? Yeah, well, it's been a crazy couple of weeks for me. Uh, there is our team. Uh, as you can see, um, we, uh, we we have grown since I joined Google five years ago. Um, and I know uh, it's, it's a pretty cool team of people to work with, to be honest. Um, here's the, the agenda for today. Uh, we are going to, first of all, just talk a little bit about what a Chromebook is for anyone who's watching this that may not know. I'll be pretty brief about that. I only spent a couple of minutes going through that. And then I want to throw over to our two guests today. Um, one is um, Kate and Sonia from St. Thomas More Primary School in Melbourne. And then to Harry from McKinnon Secondary College in Melbourne. And I, I, haven't, I have not vetted what you guys are going to talk about. I haven't told you what to say. This is perfectly just what Whatever your message is, is what we're going to hear today. Um, but I, from what I've seen of the slides, I'm excited to hear what you've got to share. And then as usual, we'll do our little uh, what's new with Google for Education. I will point out that Google I.O. was yesterday. Uh, and we announced a whole bunch of new stuff yesterday. And to be honest, I have not digested it yet. So um, Steve or Darren, if you want to jump in on any of that when we get to it, that would be awesome. Because um, I really don't know what we announced. <laughs> uh, and then we hopefully have time for some questions. Um, so just in terms of meeting the Chromebook, um, I, I think most people on this call either use a Chromebook or have heard of Chromebooks. Um, you know, we launched the Chrome browser back in 2008 um, and it was hugely successful. I think a lot of people back in that day when, you know, Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer and Firefox and everyone said, why do we need another browser? But it turns out that Chrome really changed the whole browser scene. And then in 2011, um, we released a product called a Chromebook. Uh, which is essentially a cloud-first computer platform. Um, and there's some interesting things that come across when you build a computer that's designed for the web. Um, what Chrome OS brought to the equation was uh, a range of versatile devices, so different shapes and sizes, um, really quite fast machines, even though they have lower specifications than your typical uh, Windows or Mac machine, like they managed to do a lot with what they've got in terms of speed. They're super simple to manage. They take automatic updates uh, and they're highly secure. And they've been a huge hit in schools all around the world. They are the number one uh, computing device used in schools in the world, which is you know, pretty amazing uh, considering they're relatively new. Um, the benefits of a Chrome device is you've got long battery life. They work online or offline. Uh, but you can get apps for almost everything. So you can pretty much do anything you need to do on a Chromebook. Um, like I said, they come in all shapes and sizes. They're secure from the start. And I just want to say what I mean by that is if you look at your typical, say, Windows computer, um, you've got sort of the operating system. And then to protect it, you put a layer of antivirus on top of it and you try to stop the bad things getting through that layer into the operating system. Um, Chrome OS was designed from the ground up to be secure. So the operating system actually can't be infected. You don't need that layer of protection because from the ground up, it's actually uh, built securely. So it can't be infected with anything. Um, and they start fast and stay fast. Um, I mentioned the automatic updates. I was in the hotel this morning and I walked past the guy sitting at a table, eating breakfast, waiting for his Windows machine to update. And he was just sitting there watching a little blue thing go around. And I thought, you, you, you poor man. Um, the nice thing about uh, Chromebooks is you get the automatic updates. 
they update automatically every four weeks. They do that seamless in the background thing, so you don't even know they're updating. It's just when the new system comes down, you restart the machine and presto, you're using the latest version of the operating system. Uh, they get patched uh, in less than 48 hours and you get full administrative control over which version you want to use if you choose to do that. Um, there's some of the technologies that we have inside a Chromebook to keep them secure. They have things like safe browsing, sandboxing, where we protect tabs from each other, basically, so that nothing can happen. Um, there's auto updates, data encryption, built-in security chips. They do a verified boot, a whole bunch of technologies I won't really go into here because uh, I want to hear from our guests. But just be aware that when you're using a Chromebook, they're super secure devices, which is really important in this day and age. In fact, we've had zero reported ransomware attacks on Chrome OS ever. Uh, that's a pretty big claim, but um, yeah, we've never had a ransomware attack on a Chrome OS device that's ever been reported. Uh, all right, and with that, I am going to hand over to, I oh, know I'm, I'm going to play you a little short video. This only goes for about a minute. I just want to play this to you. This is a Chromebook. And this is also a Chromebook. This Chromebook has everything a teacher could need with the power of Google for Education baked in, like docs, slides, and screencasts, which helps you easily record lessons with automatic transcription. And best of all, easily collaborate with your students because you're all on Chromebooks. Devices that flex to support the way you teach, helping you get back to this, this, and this. Made for the way you teach. Chromebook. All right. And with that, I'll try not to make that play a second time. With that, I'm going to hand over to Kate and Sonia from St. Thomas Moore Primary School. And I think what's interesting about the story that you're about to hear from these guys is that they have gone completely down the path of one-to-one -one devices for all the students, but also one-to-one -one devices, uh, Chromebooks, for all the teachers as well. And we've, we're have we seeing an increasing number of schools doing that around Australia. Um, we've got uh, you know a growing list of them that are saying these are not only just student devices, but they work really well for teachers as well. So with that, um, Kate, I'm going to hand over to you and Sonia. Uh, and um, just tell me when you want me to go forward on the slides. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Um, we love sharing our story with all of the other schools and the Google Reference schools. So um, we're excited to be here. That video pretty much summed up why we use Chromebooks. So I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so a little bit about why we made the switch. So we have been um, a Google school. We've been we've we've, we've gone through the sort of transition. So um, a Gave school, a Google Workspace school. We've we've been um, using the platform for a very long time. So over ten years now. So we are very proud to say we are one to one student devices from prep through to grade six and just like chris mentioned we also have our teachers using chromebooks um our whole school operates on the google platform so we use google sign in for everything and i think one of the reasons the most prominent reason is probably because it was most cost effective for us as a school to implement chromebooks um we know that schools are on tight budgets so the cost really made it um a no-brainer for us like chris mentioned it's all secure everything's managed through the console so in terms of setting devices up and um you know having updates and all that sort of stuff it's all done for us the teachers don't have to worry about being you know tech gurus we leave that to the experts um all of our apps are connected through the google workspace so we can make learning experiences personal um and everything is set up in a very similar way across the board. So teachers, students, um, and everything we use is the same. We decided to go the Chromebook path as well because now we know that the um, top end sort of Chromebooks also work as a tablet. So touch screen, we've got the stylus, and it works as a laptop. So um, we used to have, we started off with iPads in the juniors, and then we realized as we sort of went on through our journey that it made more sense to make the switch because iPads really aren't made for, you know, um, a shared sort of device, whereas with the Chromebook, didn't matter what device the students logged into, it always looked the same for them. So um, that's why we also went down that path. And we know that, you know, touchscreen is very intuitive to children. 
and um, our, touch, our Chromebooks are all touch screen, the teachers and student ones. One of the big game changes or one of the, you know, the um, turning points for us was obviously remote learning. And we were one to one. We started really slowly. We didn't just go, hey, here's 400 Chromebooks, start using them. We started the journey very gradually. So we started with grade six, five, four, three, two, all the way down to prep. So it did happen sort of over a period of time. But um, COVID was sort of the last sort of push for us to go, okay, it's time now. It's time for get, you know, the preps ones and twos to on the devices because at the end of the day, it's sort of um, second nature to them. If anything, it was the teachers that we had to sort of push forward a little bit more. So that helped us sort of um, get the whole school on board. And then with the touchscreen and stylus interactivity, we were able then to get rid of interactive whiteboards those um, amazing pieces of technology we used to have in the classroom. Um, no more calibrating pens, thank goodness, because I used to spend my days trying to get those things working. But with the Chromebooks and the teacher devices, we brought back the interactivity. Um, we used, you know, things like Jamboard um, for the teachers and the students to be able to collaborate and write together. So that still allowed interactivity. So that's why we, we went that way. Thanks, Chris. Um, and a lot of the schools, I think the big question is like, how, how did you do it? Tell me how you did this, because I'm going to say this word in here, all, we were previously a Mac school. So we did start our journey, um, with Apple devices and we had to obviously make a little bit of a transition. So like I said, cost was one of the big game changers for us. Um, and the Chromebooks just made a lot more sense because we were a Google school. So convincing the teachers was not the easy part. The students obviously didn't really have a say. We just got rid of the MacBooks and implemented Chromebooks. Um, but then the way we got the teachers to make the switch was we were part of a pilot program that Google offered. And I'll give you some more information about that um, just towards the end. But what we did is we, over 12 months, we had every year level, um, we gave them like a period of time to use the Chromebook in their classroom and at home during home learning. And we said, go take this home and play with it. And once they actually discovered what they could do with it, that's when they said, oh, you know what? I actually can do a lot more with this while I'm working from home with students. And I can be interactive and I can use it as a tablet and I can model and I can write and I actually can do all of these amazing things that I couldn't do with my old device. So we weren't able to just go here, this is what we're doing now. We actually had to let them play and explore with the tools and do it slowly and make them realise how creative they actually could be in the classroom by giving them the opportunity to actually do that. So that's kind of how we did that. It was slow, um, but that worked really well for us and it was successful. And so now we have three years in, We've got teachers using one-to-one -one Chromebooks, teachers on the devices, and Kate and I are currently in the process of upgrading their devices to a newer one. So, how far down the path are you here, Sonia? Like, in, how how long ago did you make the switch? Three. So it's been exactly three years since wow. teachers were on Chromebooks, wow. but before that, we got the first. So, I think how long did you say Chromebooks have been around for? Since two thousand and eight. Two thousand eight. Uh, two thousand eleven. Oh, sorry, two thousand eleven. By two thousand and twelve, we had Chromebooks at the school. So as soon as Chromebooks were launched, we ordered um, a class set of Chromebooks and that's how we started. So we had a class set and we implemented them like that slowly. So we bought one class set, shared them around a little bit and then gradually implemented them one to one, um, six filtering down grade, uh, through to grade prep. So we just bought one class set at a time and then we went on to year levels mm. and now we're basically on a whole school sort of cycle where we order 400 Chromebooks at one time on a four-year lease, and then we turn them over every four years. Impressive. Nice. Used to be three years, but due to budgeting constraint, you know, restraints, we had to stretch out the lease a little bit longer. And we find that the devices last, that it's fine after four years anyway. So um, stretching the lease out over four years just helps us to align with our budgets a little bit better. And um, the devices are still perfectly fine. Yep. So, you can ask what device models you have for We started students. the students with, oh, the teachers. And students. So, students with, 
ASA spins. We started with ASA spins. We've now moved to ASUS. Mm-hmm. I can't give the exact model number off the top of my head. Um, and the teachers have the exact same one you just saw in that video clip. So all teachers and students are using ASUS at the moment. And we're going to pretty much stick to ASUS um, just because we found it's a very sturdy in terms of children dropping it and walking around with it. Um, the ASUS spin, we had issues with the stylus, didn't go in well. Kids were kind of shoving the stylus in the wrong way, upside down, get stuck. Um, so the ASA is the way we're going, and we're probably going to stick to that path. If you want to know exact model, I can get that to you. Oh, that's just curious. And and everyone's got touchscreen as well, do they? Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Great choice. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then you got another slide here of what's happening now. Yes, so what's happening now? So um, obviously you get a little bit of pushback. We're in schools. That's how we sort of function, isn't it? But <laughs> We quickly found lots of solutions. Um, so, for example, teachers used to use GarageBand. Now we use Soundtrap. Um, there isn't anything that we sort of haven't been able to solve. The only biggest one I would say is oh, I can't. I don't. I can't airdrop anymore. Um, yep. Yeah, but we just basically got the teachers to make a folder on Drive. Make a folder on Drive. If you're on your phone, you can still put the photos, upload them on your Drive folder, and voila. On your computer it appears so even though you can't airdrop you can still drag from your phone and drop from your phone and share so that's how we get around um or got around that we've got specialist teachers also using chromebooks so um the art teachers using it as a sketchbook with their stylus teaching kids you know different tips and um art tools and um that's great because the kids can mimic exactly what she's doing in the classroom soundtrap in the um in the music area and drama teachers found lots of different apps that she can use as well. We've got spaces for planning, teachers are collaborative through workspace. Our juniors use clever QR codes to sign in. So we know that, you know, the juniors could spend hours signing in. We like from grade three up, they have to know their username and password, have to be able to type it. But from juniors, we do give them that option just to quickly sign in using clever. It just means that your lessons are more productive, obviously. Um, Again, using QR codes as airdrop as an alternative. We use slides in portrait mode. Kids are using slide, teachers using slides. Um, yeah, it's across the board, teachers, students, everyone's on board, everyone's got a Chromebook, everyone's on workspace. That's how we function that's, pretty much. That's a really impressive story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Okay, you can weigh in on anything as we go. I, like, I did like this quote. Yes, like, and and it's funny because this probably came from one of our most reluctant teachers. Kate, you would agree? Like, Absolutely. the biggest teacher would be like, no way, I'm not doing it. So she was the first one we gave the Chromebook to. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's how we like to work here. And she was the biggest advocate for, for, for a Chromebook. I do love that evil laugh of yours. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a great quote. <laughs> um all right and i also wanted to share something here on steam and chromebooks yes i'll i'll keep it short i think my slides kind of speak for themselves uh, like a little bit but um i just wanted to share a project that i've started so that we're currently doing at the moment with uh the grade fives and it was it just stemmed from an idea of um how about we look at floor plans and what we can do with floor plans in our STEAM classes. So we're sort of going through a very condensed version of like the design thinking process. Um, and each of the students have been given a client, which is a staff member. So just at just right from the beginning, we were using Google Forms to gather data for the client. So you can see the exported data here. Mm -hmm. So we're obviously using Google Sheets as well. Um, the children are using Google Slides as their digital workbook, and they've been able to just share that with their client through email. And then moving on to the actual uh, Chrome apps, we started with the Canvas app for some sketching and we moved on to the uh, Cursive app as well, just to give them exposure to both of those apps. Um, and I just, I wanted to, um, 
I posed a problem to them. I said, can we, do you think we can complete this entire project, the entire term, literally just with our Chromebook? And they were all like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Like, of course I knew that we could do it, but posing this as a um, question to them, they were like, but how am I going to, how am I going to draw that? How am I going to sketch that? What if I need to write, just write notes? And I was like, don't worry, we're going to be fine. So um, even just in the first couple of weeks, we have used workspace and chrome apps a lot um and even like this week i've obviously i'm sick so i haven't been at school but just knowing that if my kids had to be split for their steam class all they would need is their chromebook and they can go off to whatever classroom they don't need to remember their sketchbook and this printed piece of paper they literally have their chromebook and they've got everything they need i posted um, the instructions on the Steam Google Classroom, and they were fine, whatever whatever was to happen today. So you can see initially on Canvas, they've used the, um, like the gray lead sketching tool, um, and we sort of kept it really simple doing these, these sort of bubble diagrams to get the sizing and the placement right. I showed them how to use layers, so you can see the red uh, gray lead there is like the flow and how they move from room to room. So that was a layer that they could then take off. Um, and then you can see the progression to when they started using cursive. We added the background of the grid lines and you can see like the actual sketch. I, I picked a good example, by the way, like they weren't all this good, um, but you can see how they've transferred their initial sketches from Canvas into cursive. Like I said, we could have used either one of the apps to do both things, but just exposing them to both and seeing how um, they can use all of those different tools um, and just showing them that, you know, we can use our Chromebook for literally everything. And uh, this is what we're literally moving on to just so that you could see the, the the project how it's happening they're moving on to floor planner to um, make a 3d model but just a few things uh, showing why steam and chromebooks really teaching and chromebooks but i just teach steam so why they go hand in hand uh, it, you just don't need to be an expert you can show children while you're using a chromebook and they're using a chromebook that we're learning together um, and me going to 18 different classrooms every week and repeating lessons and I don't know what I can rub off someone's whiteboard. I can use cursive uh, as my whiteboard and I can save it as a PDF. I've got infinite space. I can scroll for kilometres if I want to keep adding to my notes, but I can look back on that, add it to my planning, save it as a PDF um, and not miss stuff that I said to one class and then might maybe forget to say to another class um, and it's made my teaching a bit more uh, not casual but it's just made it a bit more uh, like we are one so instead of me sitting at a desk and having to type things on a slide or standing at the front of a class with a whiteboard marker I can sit with them cast my screen be drawing while they're working I don't have to do all my teaching at the start and continually you know, go back to the front of the classroom and do something else. I can be sitting with a group of kids and someone asks a question and I can say, hey, look at the board, I'm going to model how to do something. And that's where um, the laser mode on the stylus is really handy as well. I used to have one of those little clicky things that had the laser, but pointing mm -hmm. it at a um, LCD TV, it just kind of absorbs the red light. So having that laser mode on the, um, yes, that. Having that on my um, Chromebook has been amazing because it's like click here and what we're looking for my tiny little black uh cursor so the stylus has been great and i just always reiterate to them not much can go wrong with a chromebook like you just just give it a crack and you know, i can fix about just about any problem that you have um and if you're not using a chromebook as a teacher and your children are using chromebooks then i think you're kind of I know there's lots of reasons why you might not be, might not be your choice, but you're doing a bit of a disservice because if you don't know all of these features of a Chromebook, how are the kids going to know how to use this? You're not modeling the use of it, so you're not using it to its fullest potential. That's basically it. Thank you. Big it up. I'm, I'm going to go to our marketing department, by the way, Kate. I'm going to get some T-shirts made that say Chromebooks. Um, what, what was the phrase you used? Uh, 
just give it a crack. Yeah, just give it a crack. That's what I say to them all. Just give it a crack. Don't crack them because crack. then you have to get it replaced, and that's so annoying. <laughs> no, I just no, no, no. In terms of just, just click on stuff, see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Exactly. Just click on stuff. That's a good one. Just click right, well, on thank stuff. thank you both for sharing. I think it's an amazing story, and uh, I'm, I need to talk to you more about how we spread that story even more because I think it's, it's so much great stuff going on there. Um, all right, I'm just going to move Oh, Did you want to talk about this just briefly before we That's move just, on? I've just popped that in there. If you're interested in a pilot program, I know there aren't any running at the moment, but this QR code will take you to Kimberly Hall, who um, set this up as an EOI. If anything pops up, um, she'll keep people in the loop. Okay. All right. I'll leave that there for just a second if anyone wants to scan it. Otherwise, um, we, we always give the slides out at the end of the, uh, the webinar anyway. So it'll all be in there for you. Um, all right, I am going to uh, hand over to Harry, and um, Harry's going to talk to us about his role as the tech support coordinator at McKinnon Secondary College. And Harry, correct me if I'm wrong, I think McKinnon is probably one of the largest secondary colleges in Victoria, is that right? 2,800 mm -hmm. students? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, until a few years ago where we split into two campuses, uh, we were the largest single campus school in Victoria. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And you've been to Chrome School for as long as I can remember. I think we might be one of the very first, if not the very first. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, so this is before my time, but I think it's at least since 2014 uh, that it was a one-to-one -one program for all students. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm going to hand over to you, Harry. You can walk us through um, whatever you'd like to tell us. Awesome. Thank you. So let me just pray. So I've been here for about two to three years. Uh, and let me just tell you, before, like three years ago, I never would have thought I'd be so excited to, you know, spend 10 minutes talking about Chromebooks. I've got a lot to get through. Like, I was so excited. I've tried to cram it in as much as I can. Uh, so, yep, yeah, I'm from McKinnon Secondary College. Uh, we're a non-selective entry government school uh, with 2,800 students, uh, which means we have students from all kinds of backgrounds. So uh, we run a one-to-one -one Chromebook program for all 2,800 students, and that has allowed us to achieve our key goal uh, to ensure that every student has a working device in every classroom at all times. Uh, we've So the students purchase the Chromebook, or the families purchase the Chromebooks themselves. Uh, so Chromebooks are affordable, so all students uh, are, are able to attain one. Uh, they're reliable, they're power efficient, so the battery lasts all day. We're not having all these charging cables going across, creating a ha hazard, uh, and they're cloud-based as well. Uh, so being cloud-based is particularly useful in a school environment where devices get damaged quite often, especially uh, according to our stats in years seven and nine. Uh, we see a lot of cracked screens. Uh, back in February, there was a massive storm here and we saw about 50 devices were water damaged. Um, but it's no problem. No, no devices saved on the machine. Nobody lost any work. Uh, we use Azus Chromebooks that come with a repair service where our repairs are free, uh, which is awesome. So whenever a student's Chromebook gets damaged, they crack the screen during class. It takes two minutes to get them a loan Chromebook. They open it up, they pick right back up where they left off. Uh, and the exact same thing, if they forget to bring their Chromebook to school, they can use the, a loan Chromebook for the day as well. With a Windows machine, you know, there's no like 10 to 15 minutes set up, getting them all, all set up. There's none of that that needs to go on. Yeah, that's such an important point, actually, that whole shareability. Yeah. Uh, so Chromebooks also have a really good balance between customization and managed settings. Uh, so students are able to take ownership of their device, they're able to personalize them, make them their own device, while they're also not able to screw them up and make them not work. Like they can't delete a, a key program or stuff up their drivers, they can't download a, a virus unless they really try. And if they do, it's always easy to fix. Mm. Um, so currently we're sitting at 95.5% of students have a in-warranty Chromebook. Um, sometimes that stat is even higher, tends to taper off a bit lower uh, as the year goes on because the warranties uh, expire. But yeah, uh, we're very happy with that. Wow. I'll go over to the next slide. Yep. So all this talking about teaching, uh, about Chromebooks, but we're a school and the focus is on teaching and learning. So how does all this fit together to improve the teaching and learning experience at our school? Um, it means there is a unified experience amongst students. So all students have a working device, all devices are on the same platform, and that means teachers are able to spend their, focus their energy on planning, engaging lessons. You know, they don't need to worry about accounting for a Windows device, a Mac device. They don't need to account for a, a student's Windows laptop that's decided to have a 30-minute update, or they just they didn't bring it to school today and it's too hard to get a loan 
for a day. Um, you know, a teacher's work week is effectively broken out. The entire week is broken out, broken down into 10 minute blocks. So one student or a bunch of students having an issue that lasts over 15 minutes is unacceptable. You know, it can throw off their entire uh, curriculum. Um, so students, that, I mean, that's just simply not an issue uh, when we have a Chromebook program. Mm, amazing. Okay, so I'll go over to the next slide. Uh, so we, like St. Thomas More, we have not inter, uh, you know, got Chromebooks for all staff, but we have started to, you know, squeeze in the idea of it, slip in, you know, find uses for them. Uh, one key use is critical relief teachers. So, you know, they're also known as substitute teachers. So mm -hmm. when CRTs arrive in the morning, the last thing that they want to do in the morning is spend 15 minutes with IT, getting their, their BYO laptop set up or getting a Windows laptop set up. Uh, you know, it's, it's often quite a time crunch for them to just get into class. So, yep. Uh, so uh, Chromebooks offer a fast and hassle-free experience. Um, they sign into the Chromebook, boom, they're already into Google Workspace. Uh, we have Google SAML, uh, you know, sign in through Google for our school management platform, Compass. Uh, and it's also a cybersecurity concern to have non-managed devices. So if we set up their personal device in our network and they need to print, they need to cast onto the projector, uh, that's the cybersecurity concern because we, we don't know what's on that device. So we're able to get them onto our staff VLAN without compromising our network. Mm. Uh, we also have Chrome OS Flex uh, for our teacher repair loans. So I don't know about uh, other schools, but the Victorian uh, Department of Education, through no fault of their own, uh, supplied, you know, between 2020 and 2022, the laptops that we were given had this no absolutely notorious issue with the hinges where they would just break all the time. Like I reckon a single laptop would break at least like three times in its lifespan. Huh. Um, so what Chrome OS Flex allows us to do is the exact same as the CRTs, where within two minutes, we're able to get the teacher set up on a new device while the the warranty repair person comes and fixes the device. So they, there's no disruption to the lesson. And then at the end of the lesson, they get the device back, absolutely no disruption. And again, to the point of, you know, there's no 15 minutes getting them set up with printing, you know, connecting to the network, ensuring cybersecurity concerns and all that as well. Okay. Fantastic. And then, so obviously I'm not a teacher. Um, I joined the school as a support technician about three years ago, uh, and then last year I stumbled into the you know the the Chromebook the Chrome Fleet Manager role here. Uh, I had never managed a fleet before, um, and you know my goodness, I can say it was very intuitive, very straightforward to get my head around. Uh, the whole thing nearly runs itself. Uh, pushing policies is consistent and fast, unlike. Uh, Microsoft Intune that we use to manage our Windows devices. You'll you'll set a policy, you'll try to sync it out. Devices just won't sync, they'll fail. They can take hours. Who knows what's going on there? Um, when the students purchase their Chromebooks, they purchase them with zero touch enrollment. So that means when they open their Chromebooks is straight out of the box, they connect to the internet, the device enrolls itself in our management, puts it in the correct organizational unit so they've got all the correct settings. We we need to do effectively nothing. Um, okay. That's and, pretty impressive. Actually, sorry, I might go back one more. Uh, yep, just quickly. So the Google administration console is very straightforward, very intuitive, but it also does let you do some very cool advanced things if you can get creative. So obviously, you know, we're a high school, so we have, what, 13 to 18 year olds, and you can imagine having their device with them all the time can be quite distracting. So through the Google Admin Console, we've been able to set up our own program that we've uh, collaborated with the wellbeing team and the student managers with. Uh, it's called the Master and Self-Regulate uh, Technology Program, MAST for short. And it allows us to put the students' accounts and their Chromebooks uh, into a, an organizational unit with specific controls, uh, including like DNS controls, so they can't access gaming websites. It's a lot more locked down, so they can only focus on schoolwork. So, prior to like what other it people might think like the google admin console isn't restrictive you can be as creative as you like with it okay i'll, I'll move on from there awesome. and then ironically when i was sitting down to think about what to talk about today um I, I realized perhaps the most interesting thing of all with running a chromebook program is all the it's not what we can do with the chromebooks but what we can do with all the time that we've saved you know 
not needing to manage Windows and Mac devices. So having a Chrome fleet frees us a ton of time for things. So just one example is I know setting up NAPLAN, uh, which is the national testing uh, from the Australian government. That is an absolute nightmare for Windows and Mac schools where the students have BYO Chrome, uh, Windows and Mac devices. They're the admins of the machines or they've got parental controls. They can't install the NAPLAN testing software. Uh, but with us, as you can see with my uh, nauseous, nausea inducing uh, GIF there, um, I sat down one morning, probably a Tuesday, had a coffee. Within 30 minutes, I pushed it out to all 28, or oh, all 1400 or however many students were sitting that test. Um, and the students need to do nothing. They sit down during the day of NAPLAN and they're good to go. There's no headache. And so, you know, we're not dealing with a random Windows issue, like an error code that nobody's ever seen before that takes an entire day just to fix one student's issue. Uh, and all that free time allows us to spend time on more important things. Like we, our IT team offers internal professional development. Uh, as you might have seen in my title, I run the student tech team. It's a bit of a time sink, but I wouldn't be able to do that without, uh, you know, having all this free time uh, due to having a Chromebook program. Mm. Uh, we have a 3D print lab that we help facilitate. Uh, we're able to offer better and more timely support. And we're overall, we're able to adopt a more proactive approach to IT where we're not just putting out fires with blue screens and Windows updates uh, during class, uh, but we're able to think, board, and innovate. And yeah. That's such a great story. I, I wish I could bottle that up and, uh, and share that too. And I, I, I will. <laughs> um, how many people on your team? Like, you're the Chromebook fleet manager, but how many how yeah. many other people do your job? So it's interesting. We're a team of eight. Uh, we've got four support uh, technicians, of which I am one. Uh, so I'm the support coordinator. Uh, and interestingly, the so I'm a, the student tech team manager and the Chrome fleet manager at the same time. Yet we've got an entire person just dedicated to the 300, uh, you know, the 300 and whatnot uh, Windows and Mac that the staff have. And that's a full-time position for him. So what so, you're saying is that you just you look after 2,800 Chromebooks? Yeah, obviously the support technicians facilitate repairs and stuff, but oh, the right. actual management side of it, it just yeah. it runs itself, really. Yeah. It's interesting. The industry standard, by the way, for support staff to number of machines endpoints is 1 to 70. So yeah. you're like 1 to 2,800, and you've turned it into a part-time role where you get time to do other things. So that's a pretty phenomenal uh, yeah. thing. It's, it's definitely... A background thing. Yeah. It's, it's very awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Mate, thanks for sharing so much. I really appreciate that. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, all right. Um, I am just going to, just before we wrap up, um, before we go through some of the updates, I used this analogy the other day with a group here that I was talking to, and I hope it makes sense to people with they're watching this. If you look at two vehicles on the screen there, the only two differences, one is an electric car, the Model Y Tesla on the right-hand side, electric car. The other is, I don't know what that is, an Audi or something. Um, and I likened it to like, if you imagine like electric cars are like the Chromebooks and, and the Windows machines are like, you know, petrol cars, in that from the outside, they look the same. They both look like cars. In terms of purpose, they both do the same things. They both get the same job done, but the underlying technology and the way they approach the problem of, you know, creating a vehicle is entirely different on the inside. And I think it's a little bit like that with Chromebooks and, and Windows too. Like, a lot of people will look at it and go, well, you know, Chromebooks, what do they do that Windows don't do? You know, like, and they're fundamentally different on the inside. And because of their fundamental difference, like like with an electric car, you don't have to service it often. It costs less to run. There's a whole bunch of advantages because of that different underlying technology. And it's the same thing with Chromebooks versus conventional computers, Windows or Mac. While they look similar on the outside, it's the underlying technologies that they're embedded on that actually make them work fundamentally differently in terms of cost saving and you know amount of resource required to manage and all that sort of stuff. So you know, for what it's worth, I just thought that was a little interesting analogy. Um, just going to whiz through this one in the little bit of time we have left. Um, I just picked out uh, five things that I thought would be of interest to you to know that have come out in the last uh, little while. Um, first one, really simple one, uh, if you're using breakout rooms in Google Meet now and you are taking the attendance of a Meet call, it will now also take the attendance of the people in the breakout rooms as well. Uh, that's something people have been asking for for a while. You can now do that. 
Uh, the second thing is if you're in a meet call, uh, often you'll see in some calls, you know, some people will have their videos on and some people have their videos off. You now have a little switch down the bottom there where you can say hide the tiles without video. So if you just want to simply turn off all the people who aren't sharing video because they're not seeing it anyway, uh, you can declutter your screen a little bit by that switch. Um, in Google Drive, you've always been able to navigate around Google Drive with some keyboard shortcuts. We've just updated all the keyboard shortcuts and now they have what we call first letter navigation. So if you're looking at a list of files in your drive and you want to jump to a file, you just got to press the first, press the keyboard letter for the first letter of that file name and it will automatically jump to that file name. So it's just a quicker way of getting around. Now, because they introduced this first letter navigation, they've actually remapped a lot of the old keyboard shortcuts. So if you were a keyboard shortcut person inside Drive, you might find that some of those have changed. Um, when I share these slides at the end, uh, if you follow that more information link down the bottom there, uh, it'll take you to the article that actually has all the new remappings if you want to uh, revisit those. Um, the two things I'll actually show you is uh, two things that are interesting in Google Sheets. Uh, one is that it will now automatically convert data into drop downs. And I'll give you an example of what I mean if I click on this and share this tab. So here's a little spreadsheet. And uh, you'll notice if I click in anywhere inside this category thing, for example, I've got this option now to convert to drop down chips. So if something can be converted to a drop down, it offers to do that. Now it doesn't. It doesn't, I've found that it doesn't always pick it up on every single field. So if I do that there, or if I convert that, but if I click into this one, for example, it's not doing it on that one. I'm not quite sure what the difference is, but you can force it if you just select the things, right click it and say, uh, where is it? Um, smart chips, uh, sorry, drop down, drop down. So you, you, you can manually turn it into a drop down if you need to. So it does automatically pick things up now, or you can man, uh, manually force it over to be that way. Let me just, undo both those changes because then I want to show you the last thing here. Um, sorry, the last thing here, um, which is, what do I, uh, I did that one, there you go. Um, this new feature inside uh, Google Sheets called Tables. Um, I think this is a really neat feature because there's so many people out there, you probably know some of them, who aren't that great with spreadsheets and they just like they, they're never quite sure what to do uh one person in the chat just put their hand up <laughs> um but so this is designed to help people who aren't really spreadsheet people just be more productive with spreadsheets and let me show you what it does let me go back over to my sample table again um so you'll see i've got this spreadsheet full of stuff here but i want to do things with it so if i just select the all the data i now have the option under the format menu to convert it to a table, right? So this is a new thing that wasn't there before. So if I say convert to table, it actually just turns that whole thing into a table. Now, once it's converted into a table, one of the challenges for people with spreadsheets is just getting the data in the correct uh, data type. So for example, expenses should be currency, um, uh, dates should be date and so on. So what you can do now is from this little drop down, you can edit the column type and you can say, I want that to be uh, currency. So now, it, it, and you see it puts a little uh, the money symbol next to it. So what it's doing is it's making sure that this data is actually formatted correctly as, um, as currency and so on. So that's pretty neat. But the other thing that I really love about this is, you know, we've got a table here and the data is, we, we can slice and dice this data in all sorts of ways. By clicking on the little views icon in the top corner here, you can create what's called a group. So I might want to say, let's separate, say, the, um, the the category, the income and expense category. So we'll go in here, we'll select by category, and you can see what it does. It splits my table. Make this a bit bigger. Uh, it splits my table into all the expenses and then all the incomes. It just really easily just splits it up. This is like a pivot table for people who don't know how to do pivot tables. Uh, if I go back in there again, I say, let's create a different one there. Let's let's uh, sort it by say. Um, uh, item type, right? And you can see now it's it's doing it by item type. So it's a really simple way of sort of taking that data you've got uh, and and it saves them there for you so you can switch back and forth between them. So um, yeah, I, I'd just sort of share that with you. I think that's a nice new feature. Um, if you want to save that view, you can save it and give it a name. Um, uh, but that's, uh, that's tables. I'd encourage you to go and have a fiddle around with it if you have not yet looked at it. 
Uh, and with that, I am going to try and stick to time. I think we've done reasonably well. Uh, I'll share this tab again. So just as we wrap up, just a reminder to everyone, um, we do have, if you are a Google champion, uh, like some of you are in the in the call today, or if you are a Google um, admin, like some of others are, like you, know, you Harry, um, we do have a Google admin hub and a Google champions hub uh, on this address now, google for edu communitycom So you can go on there, uh, log in, and join either one of these hubs. Now, you, if, if you have to be a champion to join the champions hub, you have to be an admin to join the admins hub, uh, and they will actually just check it make sure that you are who you are. Uh, but once you go in there, these are thriving communities of users who are also sharing ideas and having conversations and talking about different things. So um, great community if you are one of those uh, in one of those groups. Um, we would love some feedback on today's session. I think, I think hearing from uh, the two schools today was awesome. Um, so I just want to uh, say thanks again uh, and could you please if you are listening to this call could you please uh, take that QR code or, or that address there pop in and just leave us quickly a little bit of feedback on today's session um, as that quote there we all need people who will give us feedback that's how we improve uh, sadly it was Bill Gates who said that but anyway um, <laughs> uh, and congratulations to Gillian who uh, was our winner last month uh, and Congratulations to you. Uh, we um, we do do a draw of everyone who fills in the feedback form each month. Uh, we'll pick a name at random and send you out some Google swag. Gillian, what did we send you? Sorry, I was um, didn't have my mic on. Oh, you sent me a fabulous bag and a cap, which awesome. was brilliant. So thank you so much. No I love all my Google things. No worries. Thanks, Julian. Appreciate it. Uh, and um, Steve or, or Darren, did you have anything you wanted to add about any of the updates from IO? Anything you particularly want to call out? Um, look, it was it was so much. Was um, a lot. <laughs> I I did find a good fourteen minute summary of of all, and even after fourteen minutes, it was a lot of stuff. Um, there is an amazing... like the, the one that The Verge did seems to be the best summary. Yeah, The Verge seems really good. Look, the, I really like, um, if you haven't seen the section on Notebook LM, um, there is a really great tool that's that's in kind of trusted tester at the moment, but it does allow you to put all your own documents in there and basically gives you your own little um, chatbot Gemini style just on what you upload. So I'm currently building one now around um palm oil well put a whole lot of resources into it and you can um you can you can interrogate that data and have chats with it which is pretty amazing i, um, I just wanted to call this one out this was uh, this is from the keyword blog which is uh, where we publish all the updates um there's a whole bunch of creative stuff that they're applying AI to now. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. I won't go through it, but like there's a video generation tool. Look at these videos. This is all just AI generated video. This is going to change the way people make films. Um, yeah. And then if you go down a bit, this is the new AI model for image generation. And you can see, again, these are all synthetically generated images with AI. They're just astounding. Mm -hmm. um, if you think back to just like, yeah, you know, six to twelve months ago, if you looked at the images that were being generated by AI, and people had like eight fingers and like all weird stuff happening. And this is this stuff's really coming together. Um, and one of the cool things that was announced as well, Chris, around this was the fact that we're working really hard on inserting a digital watermark into things. Mm -hmm. So if some if an image is created by AI, it will actually have a digital watermark on it. Yeah. So you can see what is artist created and what is AI created. It, that's important. I think I read somewhere the other day that uh, uh, more than half the countries in the world this year are having elections. Yeah, and uh, the very idea very that so much of this stuff can be basically deep faked <laughs> is, is concerning. So that's a great idea that we're watermarking stuff. Um, but the other thing, I, I, I remember tweeting something a while ago that said, oh, you can generate music with AI, but I'd never listen to it. You know, um, I got to say, I was watching this stuff today at some of the way these artists are using AI to generate music. It, it is astounding. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll uh, I'll make sure when we send out the, uh, the 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 
sheet, uh, the uh, slides from this call. I'll put some of these links in there if you want to follow them along and take a peek. I believe Chris was really? also a teaser video of some updates coming to classroom as well. Um, there was a few education focused mentions near the end of the keynote. Um, yep. So if you watched on the last little bit of the keynote, there was a few little little hints of education things that might be coming out quite soon. So do have a look at at IO. Um, if you want to just do a quick Google search for education announcements at IO, you might find some of those keyword blogs that Chris has, has shared because there was a bit of stuff teased there that um, you might find quite mm. interesting. Yep. Great stuff coming out of the pipeline. Yep. All right. So uh, please remember the feedback. Uh, if you want to revisit some of our previous webinars, there's a scan code there or a URL or I'll, we'll send you the slides. Uh, if you want a certificate for attending today, such things, um, are something you want, then uh, you can just fill that form in there and it will automatically create a certificate and email it to you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you. We did go a few minutes over time, so my apologies. But um, uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. And thanks to our guests. It's been awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Got to figure out how to turn the recorder off. <laughs>